Well, as you see on the picture, I'm working at Beamlines. Uh, actually, the, the actual Beamline is Icon at Paul Scherer Institute, where I'm a Beamline scientist. And um, well, this was, we had an extremely rainy weekend. So um, I spent the whole weekend at the Beamline instead. So about me and my role. So first of all, I'm instrument scientist doing neutron imaging. But at the same time, I'm also working on image processing and developing software for analyzing uh, um, neutron images. <clears throat> my background is um, not physics at all, uh, I, I would say. Um, I'm, I have a background in computer systems engineering and signal processing. So that actually brings me to the image processing side. Um, I came in contact with the neutrons um, as a postdoc at ETH uh, when I was doing image processing for um, soil physics. And that also gave my, me a uh, something to, to work with, um, in particular than studying uh, processes in porous media. Uh, right now, I'm working as an um, uh, instrument scientist for neutron imaging, and I'm also teaching um, image processing for experimentalists, essentially, uh, at ETH at, in Zurich. And as I mentioned before, my research interests are in the area of porous media and image processing. So that's a little short introduction to who I am. Um, well, I actually am Swedish, grew up on the Swedish West Coast. Um, and then some 18, 19 years ago, I moved to Switzerland. So, so much about um, me. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Let's see, where is my screen? There it is, yeah. And this one, and that one, and that one. So let's see if this one works now. Oops, yeah, it does. So um, I'm going to talk about introduction to computer tomography. This as such is a topic which is both um, about physics, but also about mathematics and image processing. So it's a very wide topic. And if you look at groups working on um, computer tomography, you find them actually in departments um, in all these fields. So they can be strict mathematicians, they can be physicists optimizing the setups. Andrew, sorry, there's something funny about your screen share there. We see sort of a small uh, version of it. Oh, okay, sorry, I'll... Kind of strange. Uh, yeah, uh, sharing is pulsed. Why? Do you see it now? I'll do it in another way. Okay, you, you only see this, this small one. We saw a small version of that somehow. Yeah, it was kind of weird. Yeah, so I hope yeah. this is better. Yeah, we can see that, yeah. Yes, good. So uh, let's go back again. Uh, so um, I was in the middle of telling about uh, where you can find computer tomography. Uh, so this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about now. And um, in principle, going through all the topics, all of them, um, actually, if I go back to this, a very uh, relevant thing is actually that it's theory and practical details for the experimentalist. And um, that is actually focused on, on this um, lecture. So... Um, what we want to do is to learn how the images are formed. Now, Robin talked already quite much about that. So uh, there will be some overlap. Uh, you will also see that there are differences between different ways to reconstruct the data. And um, also which key parameters you have to tune and tweak in order to get um, the best images from the reconstruction. In the end, artifacts is something that is always present. As soon as you do experiments, you will have some kind of artifacts, noise, and you have to learn to deal with it in order to get your result. Um, so the problem is we have a solid item to investigate. And uh, the first thing we do is to take it, look at it from the outside. Hmm, yeah, okay, it has elongated shape, has two buttons on it. Uh, and so on. 
uh, the baby would probably continue um, trying to put it in the mouth, check it out. Okay, it's also firm, can't chew on it, or can chew on it. Um, but still, we don't only know about the outside. So the next step is to cut the thing in pieces. But often we don't want that because uh, if we cut it into pieces, it's already lost because it's damaged. You can't use it again. And in some ca cases, for example, if you have a very rare object from the museum, I don't think they are so happy if you take the big saw and cut it into pieces. So it's not also not a good idea. So the next step is to use some kind of transmission image. Um, and um, well, in this case, you see it down here. Um, I only have a candle through a, a glass of wine. You see something through the, um, on the menu behind it, but um, this is a very weak source. So you don't see very much and um, it's not really penetrating uh, denser materials. So the light, single light source is maybe not the right thing to work with. We have different kinds of sources to illum uh, illuminate our samples with. So on one side, which you know already from um, the hospitals or the x-rays, which most people know about, it's an electromagnetic radiation uh, with higher energies than the visible light. Uh, it interacts with the electron shells, and then you get some uh, attenuation coefficients uh, related to uh, the, the electron density. With neutrons, we can also penetrate the sample, but we have different um, mechanisms here. First of all, um, it's a particle beam. And the neutrons, they interact with the nucleus instead. And here, it's more about the constellation of how many neutrons and protons you have in, um, in each um, atom or isotope. And... Um, Let's see, I got something on the chat. Ah, okay, that was the old one. Okay, uh, so this will give us a new set of attenuation, attenuation coefficients. And, um, but let's first um, step back a little bit and uh, instead of talking about attenuation co coefficients directly, uh, let's see what the transmission image actually is. So what we do is we have this ray Let's see if I can change. No, I can't. No, okay. Uh, we have this ray that is going through the sample and it's attenuated. And you can see here the, the shaded gray that is attenuated more or less through this, uh, uh, thanks to this object. And in the end, you will have here some attenuation and you know, all intensity profile corresponding to um, how much beam came through the sample. And this is described by Bia Lambert's law, which uh, Robin already mentioned. Um, what it is, um, you have here um, mainly um, this exponential, which is to the power of the line integral through some material with some coordinates. And this tells you how much the beam is attenuated. Actually, I see here that I missed a minus sign, should be a minus here. <laughs> Um, and um, so you have the incident beam here, which is attenuated, and this is afterwards what you actually see. And um, this, in, in practice, is measured like we have uh, first this um, image, which I here call R for the radiograph. Um, there we subtract some dark current, a technical detail, because the camera contains some... Um, dark um, current bias. So there is more or less a bias in the detector image of some hundred counts, which you have to subtract. Otherwise you will have biases afterwards in uh, your um, uh, normalized image. Then you have also the open beam or flat field, it's or incident um, beam image. There are many names for it, but uh, essentially the same thing. It's the beam profile. So the, the beam is not, or actually mostly not completely flat, but it has some kind of profile depending on 
uh, how the source is uh, constructed. Here you can see it's more or less a roundish shape, but in, in other cases, it can be very different shape on it. And of course, it also depends on the field of view, how much you see this curvature of the background. You also see the same thing in the image with the sample. So it's like a halo around it. And this is what we want to normalize. And then afterwards, you get here. Um, actually, this gives you the transmission image. And this here gives you the optical thickness. And the optical thickness is the attenuation coefficient times the thickness of the object. And um, this can be looked into. Uh, we have um, this integral or sum, depending on the material. In some materials, it's actually more, you can put it into a discrete set of, um, of objects, uh, like you have a container, you have water, you have um, yeah, some solid material. And in the end, you can just sum the three of them times the attenuation coefficients, and that makes life a bit easier. But for tomography, we're actually interested in the continuous case. And then we let uh, this uh, delta x go towards zero, and then we have this integral instead. And then you can see that it can actually cope with um, gradual changes within the material. And this is what we are going to need now for the tomography. I talked a lot about the attenuation coefficients, and so did also Robin before. Uh, just to compare what you have, uh, I use these two uh, periodic systems. And um, I have colored or toned uh, the different um, elements with how much they attenuate uh, when the beam goes through. And you can see here from the x-rays that it's gradually going towards the higher densities and that's the high densities, they're all more and more opaque. With neutrons, you don't have this logic uh, uh, configuration. So for example, hydrogen has a lot of attenuation, whereas you see uh, here down here, we have lead, which you know from x-rays that lead is good for shielding. Lead is useless for shielding with neutrons. So uh, you can see here the differences. And if we look at this camera, you can see that uh, in the X-rays, you see all the metal components. And uh, with the neutrons, you can see all the plastics. And even you can see the, the small notches here uh, from the film that is used to feed forward the film. You can even see them through the camera. That gives you how sensitive the neutrons are compared to X-rays when it comes to hydrogen containing materials. Another example is uh, looking at these attenuation uh, curves. You can see how much um, you transmit through different materials. So here I have water, aluminum, iron, and lead, which is the combination in this object here. This object is a fist size uh, cannonball from the Battle of Bosworth um, back in 1485. And, um, Back then, they started do experimenting on battlefield um, ballistics, and uh, they used this uh, kind of lead uh, cannonballs and cast in some iron pieces. In this case, it was some kind of ring-like objects. With X-rays, you can't can forget essentially to get through a lead object like this, but with neutrons, you easily get through. You also relatively easily go through the iron. But where we got the problem was actually on the corrosion. The corrosion contains a lot of hydrogen, and these were the hotspots in our images. But with radiography, it's not always that we see, through, see very well contrast between things. So if you have a very thick object, and you see have a little, little item in it, and you want to see it, if you have a radiography, the contribution given by all the material surrounding the, or embedding this little item is so high that you don't see it. The contrast is too little. So we need something different. And the different thing is computer tomography, where you can actually get the information along the line. So uh, in this slide, um, let's see, where do I have the drawing? Yeah. 
So um, in this slide, I didn't get it. <laughs> Why? I said I wanted it for. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it works. Okay, good. So um, in this slide, what I'm doing is I'm pulling the ray through here and see, see here which intensity I get. Then I take the ray through here and get, see what I get, what kind of intensity I get from there. You can see that in this case, you have a little bit of the brighter blob here, uh, about the same amount of the black. And um, you see the difference here is not very much. It's something like, what is it, 20-ish percent or even less. No, something around 20% contrast difference. But within the object, you can see the variations goes from 0 0.7 to 0. So you would actually be able to, if you can follow what's happening along this line, like this, then you see much better contrast. And that is the reason why we want to do the tomography. Uh, the other thing is, you can't tell where, you can, you, if you can see through here that you have something, but you can't tell in the depth where it is. You can just say that, okay, in the green one, I have more or less of something, but you can't tell where it is. So you want to know that it's buried about this place, but it's, you can't from the, just the summing of along the ray. Oops, let's see if I can switch that off. And then we come to stereography, uh, which was, um, well, I need to get rid of my internet. So that's it. Um, so uh, also Robin showed a little bit about stereography. So to get the depth information, you could do the trick that you actually look from on, at the object from two different directions. So the first one would be looking uh, through this way. So you have this clock, you look at it through the short end and you look through the wide end. And you can see that you get profiles uh, like this on the wide end and profile like this on the short end. This we can now combine. So we just more or less draw this profile throughout the whole image in this direction. Then the other side of the profile would draw out like here. And you can see already that there are a few, uh, let's see if I can get, uh, yeah. So you can see that there are a couple of uh, corner points that tells us about what extents this object has, but you can't tell much more. You can say that, okay, there are some lines that are crossing each other, but well, much more you can't tell. You can just tell more or less where it's located uh, in the depth. So we need still need something new. Um, it's not enough to do this uh, stereography. And um, to continue, so uh, we have this example where we have a single projection and you have very many solutions. So if you have a very dense, dot, you would get the same sig signal as if you would have a, a long object, which is less dense, it would look very much the same. And you can't tell which one is what. Then you have a, a yet another one. If you do stereography, you could have this constellation that you have either you have four objects spread out with half the attenuation coefficient, as in this case, but where you only have two. And again, you can only get the, the um, unique solution if you have infinite information, which we never can get because that would take much, much too long time and we don't have the detectors for it. So we have to do something else. So now is the question, what is tomography? I, you have seen it in the title. I mentioned it a little bit. I hinted a little bit on it. So it is a method to capture three-dimensional images but it's an indirect method because you can't measure 3D directly. Um, so you have to collect a lot of images, projections, uh, in order to reconstruct what's inside the object. And um, tomography is a word constructed from the Greek where you have tomos, which is a section or cutting, and graph is writing. So you're actually writing the cross section of an object. 
This is a method that has a very long history. It started out in 1917 with uh, Johannes Radon, an Austrian mathematician who developed uh, a mathematical foundation for required to do the inversion um, that is required for tomography. But it had to take 40 years about before Bracewell came up with a relationship that made this inversion relate, give it at a relation to the Fourier transform, which gives us a much easier life to work with it and understanding it. And um, then it took yet another, what, um, so seven years. And then become the first application uh, where they did some back projection and did some reconstruction based on Radon's um, result. And um, in 1970, then the first publication with the CT image was published. And now we're coming into uh, these uh, three guys and it was Cormac and Hounsfield that built the first CT scanner. And what they did was essentially they had a point source and they had um, a single uh, detector, single point detector, and then they just measured point wise throughout the image. Then they rotated the object and then they did the same scanning. So it was an extremely time consuming uh, task to get um, a CT image. Still, they had just um, some kind of slice of a brain, I think, in, um, in resin. So they had plenty of time to do this. But uh, it's not very practical in, um, in real uh, medical applications. Anyway, in the end, afterwards, um, at, in 1979, uh, Cormac and Hanswell Field, they were awarded with the Nobel Prize in Medicine for this um, machine. And today, uh, computer tomography is everyday a method in, in the hospitals for diagnostics. And to get a volume of some slices uh, over the body takes a few seconds and you got already your 3D data. Well, actually reconstruction takes a little bit of time afterwards, but the scanning goes in in a few seconds. So, um, so I, I already talked about rotating and looking at different views. We, we looked at zero and 90 degrees, but for the tomography, we need a lot more. So we have to rotate the sample um, and get images from different positions. And here you can see a fly, uh, which I'm rotating on, on, the, on the turntable. And um, well, I normally what we do is taking something like uh, three, between 300 and a thousand projections uh, is what we normally do within neutron imaging. I'll come to back to that uh, about how many projection you should take. But um, in general, it's several hundred projections that you need to do a good reconstruction. And the first attempt of reconstructing uh, the data is to set up an algebraic solution. So in principle, what you have is you have the measurements of uh, different intensities. And then you have also positions throughout the, the image. And then you want to know what is the actual uh, information. And this results in, we have a system matrix, which tells us how the, the object is rotated. We have um, the measurements, and then we want to know the X. This is a linear equation system. So in principle, it would be solvable, but first of all, it's extremely many equations you have is also very sparse um, equation, uh, matrix A. So there is no unique solution to this problem. And um, I would say it's um, classified as severely ill-posed um, system. The other way of doing it is to do back projection. And that was what I did when I had a, a stereogram. So let's just take a single projection. You plot it in, you paint it in, into the image. And um, then you see first, okay, I get the bump. If you have two projections, 90 degrees uh, offset, then you can see, okay, I have a large blob and a little blob. 
And then when you add in more and more projections, you can see that with four projections, you can start seeing, okay, maybe it's roundish. And the thing here is also roundish, but you see there is a lot of streaks. Uh, adding more and more projections in the end, you can see you get a very smooth, you can see that the object is round and there is a round thing within it. But it, this is very smooth. So something is still missing in this solution. And uh, that is something we have to come up with in the reconstruction algorithm. And um, in principle, what the reconstruction is, is the reverse process of what physics is doing for us. So we have a lot of projections and we want to find out what is the cross section that gave us all these projections. You can do uh, the inverse radon transform or you can solve the equation system. So these are the two options we have to, um, to get this um, cross section information. The first thing we need, or actually there's a piece of terminology is we need a projection from each direction. And when you extract information from all projections, like let's take the red one here, um, from each line um, and put them together. So then you would have on one side, you have the horizontal axis of the image. And on the other axis, you have the angle that it was acquired. And that gives us a sinogram and a sinogram is the information that is required to reconstruct a single image. And um, some examples here, um, as you can see here, uh, we have uh, three cases of sinograms. The first one uh, here is, oops, sorry, um, is from the region around the neck and the wings. So you can see the neck is relatively dense. So that's on that curly thing here. And then you have the wings, which are a little bit closer to rotation center and also a little bit more narrow together. And that's this uh, double helix that you can see here. And you can, now you can also see the reason why it's called sinogram, because what you see is actually a sine curve corresponding to each point in the reconstructed image. In the main body, you can see it's a lot of um, attenuation and you can see the two arms which are following two separate uh, lines here. And this last one is around the legs where you have this double helix that only has two dots in it or two, two lines in it. Now I'm coming to some equations. Um, we already looked at the BLMS law, which gives us the, the projection information that we are using to reconstruct. Um, so this is what we measure. This is described by this equation where we have the object uh, distribution, uh, spatial distribution of attenuation coefficients. And we have the observing ray, which is a delta function at some specific point. Uh, point. And um, well, then this is the, the position along the, the projection axis. And this together is what we want to to look at. And this equation is essentially the Radon transform of, of the object. The transform as such is what physics is doing, but now we want to have the inverse of this. And one way to get there is to use the Fourier slice theorem. And for that, we need to take help of some Fourier transforms. And um, let's just start with looking at the projection um, oops, sorry. Um, a single projection in, in um, say at direction zero gives us this profile. Okay. Um, you can see that there are some denser regions on the corners, something in the middle and some gaps in the middle somewhere here. Now this, we apply the first uh, one degree, uh, one dimensional uh, Fourier transform and we get something like this it tells us essentially there is a lot of bias information so DC information and some ripple at low frequencies but almost nothing at the higher frequencies. Now if we take the whole image here and compute the two-dimensional Fourier transform you get this um, 
spectrum, two-dimensional spectrum. And with that, you have in the middle, you have a very bright dot. That's the, the constant uh, level information. And uh, now is a question how these two are connected with each other. Let's take this single line through the middle and look at it. Then it's actually exactly the same as this one. And thanks to that, we can now actually do the Fourier transform in 1D and paint it into the 2D uh, Fourier spectrum. And um, then if we would have, uh, for example, um, let's see, yep, um, something, a projection in this direction, then you would have to draw in your spectrum like this. Um, or in this direction, then you would have to draw it in like this. And then you can just do uh, the one dimensional spectra and actually paint them in and rotate them. And after a while, if you can fill it in a lot, then you have actually filled in the whole two dimensional Fourier spectrum and you are ready to go back again doing the inverse uh, 2D uh, Fourier transform and get back. And then you have your reconstructed image. So with the help of this, Bracewell were able to formulate the analytical solution to the inverse. And that is actually what we're going to use um, in our reconstructions. Uh, what we also need, when, when you put all these uh, spectra together, there is a high data density in the middle and almost nothing out at the high frequencies. So what we need to do is actually to normalize uh, with a ramp function to get a flat image, uh, a flat spectrum. And this is uh, what you see down here, this um, omega. So you have to actually multiply by, by omega to, to scale the projection data in the spectrum. This can be moved over to the spatial domain and um, multiplying by some function in, um, in, the, in the frequency domain is the same as convolving it in, um, in the spatial domain. So now we're coming towards uh, doing the reconstruction and the reconstruction is again, the back projection, but we also need to uh, filter the image uh, with this um, convolution kernel. Now the, the shape of this kernel is, um, let's see, again, there we have the pen. Uh, the shape of this kernel is just like a V around the zero frequency. Oops. And um, that is the same as uh, the derivative. So it's actually the du of the projection. And uh, that is what we are, are using to, in our, as our reconstruction filter. In many algorithms, this convolution is actually done in the frequency domain, but you don't have to. You can actually define this uh, convolution kernel also in spatial domain. So that's up to uh, the implementation, how, to, how you would do it. It's pretty trivial to do it in the frequency domain because it's already defined there. So that is what's often done. And uh, typically what we have when we do our um, reconstruction is we have our projection data where the images are in the coordinate system U and V over the angles. We create our sinograms and we compute the uh, log norm to, uh, to handle the uh, Lambert's law, may remove some artifacts. Then we apply the filter doing the back projection. And finally, we have some reconstructed volume. Uh, just to relate, come back to the sinogram, I have some line integrals that correspond to, uh, to different points in, in the data. So for example, if you want to reach this uppermost corner, uh, then you can follow this uh, magenta sine curve and do the integral along that one. If you want to have this point, you see it's now centered. So it's going just like a, an arc out like this. Oops. Nay, come on, ah, there it is. Uh, if you have the center point, it's actually just a straight line through uh, the sinogram. Now it's 
very inconvenient to do it actually following this um, sine curves. So the algorithms are doing it a bit differently, but in principle, the contributions to reach these points are the ones that correspond to what you see here along these curves. And um, now the um, reconstruction filter, let's take a little bit more look at it. So we have this derivative contribution, which is just a ramp, but the ramp is amplifying high frequencies and at high frequencies, there's usually very little information left about the image, but there is a lot of noise. So what you do is you apply also an additional apodization filter and they have different names depending on their shapes. There is uh, Shep Logan, Humming, Von Hahn, Butterworth, Blackwell, et cetera, et cetera. There are many of these uh, windows that are, are used uh, for the reconstruction apodization with the aim to reduce the noise, but at the cost of um, some sharpness. So let's take a look at the projection. We have the profile of it here, looking at the, the profile, uh, the, the Fourier transform, the profile, you can see that you just have this peak. Then you multiply by this uh, omega ramp and you can see that um, there's a lot of noise in here, but you don't want this noise to appear because that's also inconvenient afterwards. So what you can do is here, you can see the, the different filter functions. You have the humming window, for example, which is essentially just a cosine uh, shape plus a bias. Uh, then if you multiply the two of them, you can see that the filter shape is something like this. And after applying this filter, you can see this part, you almost have, you don't have so much high frequency uh, noise like you had over here. And that will help you to get nicer uh, reconstructions afterwards. So um, first, this is what we tried doing in the beginning when I said something is missing, we have a very smooth solution. But adding the ram lack filter, you see, okay, now I got some nice sharp edges in, in the data and you can start seeing features, but maybe it's a little bit too noisy. That's for you to tell actually. Um, so I decide here, okay, I need a humming filter with this or that cutoff frequency. And um, then we get rid of the noise, but you can also see that this comes at a cost that you may miss some of the features that could be relevant for your investigation. So when you apply filters, you have always to be careful that you don't remove information that you would need. So, um, well, there are a set of different filters which are available within the, the software. So if you'd like to try them out and see the effects, you are free to do so. Um, then this was the analytical way of reconstructing. It's still an underdetermined system, but um, we can actually cope pretty well anyway. But there are cases when the analytical solution has a problem, and that is when you have too few projections. So the system is undersampled. Then you start getting a lot of artifacts. If you remember from, um, from this um, blob thing, you can see that there were streaks coming out from the smaller blob. Um, and these streaks are due to undersampling. Another case which could happen is that you have an irregular um, distribution of the ang acquisition angles. There are some systems that actually produce this kind of uh, data. And um, the analytical solution doesn't really cope with that very well. You would get quite some ugly streaks in order to, uh, from these reconstructions. Another one, which is actually also uh, pretty common in medical applications, in particular for mammography, is to do a limited view tomography. But as you can see, you have a very dense sampling in this in these few angles but the rest you don't have anything and the artifact you get looks like small um, small hats on each object so instead of having a round object 
uh, you would possibly get something that looks like, um, so you would expect that you had a round object, but if you do this limited view, what you get instead is something that goes out like this. You would still get a reconstruction that tells you where the object is, but you can't really say how large it is or the extents of it. But sometimes it's actually enough just to tell if it's if you have a slab. Uh, in my typical example is that you have a slab with roots. It's good to know if the roots are on the front side or the back side. And that would be sufficient to information here then. Another thing that can also be a problem is um, when you have too low signal to noise ratio, so extremely noisy data, it's also hard to handle, or actually it's always bad to have low signal to noise ratio because you can't actually determine things um, within it. Um, another one is that you have too few gray levels in very fast tomographies, which uh, Nikolai is going to talk about tomorrow, um, it can be that you maybe only count something like 10 to 20 neutrons per voxel or pixel in the projections. And that's very little. And that gives you also low contrast. You can handle it a little bit by increasing the number of projections, but still few levels is also not good. So you want to ha have a high dynamics in your images and you also want low signal to noise ratio to get good data. So if you have all these uh, ugly cases, there are iterative methods that can give you a help, a help on um, to get data which looks more reasonable. And these are two types. One is the algebraic, algebraic set, which essentially, um, give you ways to, to invert the, this very huge matrix in a more efficient numerical way. Um, the other way would be if you have very low signal of noise ratio is that you can use statistical methods where you model the, the noise. And with that, you can also improve the reconstruction quality. Uh, you can also, in these methods, you can even include physical models that, uh, that handles uh, scattering, beam hardening, um, yeah, and how, how the, the beam interacts. You can even have a Monte Carlo simulator included in the iterations. That's very time consuming, by the way. Um, with these methods, you can also provide prior information. So if you have an idea what it should look like, then you can provide this. And often it's a good idea to provide a prior in order to get good uh, performance. Another um, negative side of it, it's extremely time consuming. What is done in each iteration is essentially a back projection and a forward projection. So it's already twice the time of the filter back projection for each iteration. And you do this um, maybe 50 or 100 times. And um, of course, it takes a lot of time. And for that, people have developed um, these reconstruction algorithms on, uh, on graphic cards, and then they can speed it up and actually doing iterative reconstructions in reasonable time. So um, what we need to do is building up some um, um, equation system where you have the different uh, weights um, which are related to the um, orientation of the beam. And then you should, uh, and these x's are the ones that describe uh, the material at the different points. So um, building this matrix is a big thing. Uh, if you have a thousand projections, which are a thousand pixels wide, and you want to reconstruct a thousand by a thousand uh, pixels, then you have a uh, a very large matrix. And uh, it's usually not feasible to bring it into a normal computer. And it would probably also not be very efficient to try to invert it um, with brute force. So that is why you need to do these iterative uh, things. So this A matrix is sparse. It's ill-post, uh, which means you have 
infinitely many equations. You, you, you need infinitely many equations. And also, if you try to invert it, it doesn't provide a unique solution anyway. One of the methods that is presented in the literature is the so-called uh, algebraic reconstruction method, um, ART, more art, which iterates over the, the columns in the A matrix together with the data for, for iteration something. And then you have some kind of regularization, param uh, relaxation parameter for each iteration. And then you can go on uh, iterating, updating the columns by column all the time until you reach some kind of stability. Um, and other methods are SIRT or IRT, uh, no, SIRT or, yeah, IRT, yes. Um, there are modifications of this um, in one, this is working column wise, other ones are using the whole projections at once. And uh, then you have other um, regularization techniques like based on total variation. But the idea of all of them is, is that they want to find the solution that is stable and as noise free as possible. Then if you have statistic methods, then you not only have this ax equal y, but you also have some noise with some um, a noise model. Usually this noise model is um, Poisson based, but you could actually add other noise models on top of it because you also have noise from the sampling, you have noise from the camera, and um, then you have also uh, you, um, binomial noise and you have Gaussian noise. You can put everything into a big bin, but usually the main noise source is Poisson distributed. And then you have this iteration scheme where you um, do some error calculations, update strategies, compute some probabilities. So actually what you're doing here is to optimize probabilities as the task of this uh, likelihood um, maximization. So um, that was a lot of math. Now let's go to geometry, um, actually beam geometry. And we have different uh, beamline configurations in um, photography. One is that you work with a static beamline which is the case when you have a large scale facility. Um, in the end, you want to have images from different sides of the object. And um, it's much easier to rotate the object than um, a neutron source around the object. Usually the object is about some few centimeters. So it's easier to put it on the turntable and let it rotate and then take images while doing that. The other one is to have a rotating beam line and then you have a gantry that rotates with source and detector, and it rotates around the patient. And um, that is, of course, very convenient for the medical imaging, because you, I don't think the, the patient would like to be rotated about, I don't know, a um, couple of RPM um, during the scan. So then it's much better to, to let the source and detector rotate. We also have different kinds of beam. Uh, pencil beam is the very first step when you start doing basic experiments with acquisition is actually you have a pencil beam well collimated that you scan across a grid um, point by point until you have the whole image. This is extremely slow process of acquiring data. So, um, it's not used uh, for tomographic, mo mostly not used for tomographic purposes. Um, this is how Hansville did it, uh, I already told, but it's, it's not really practical, uh, feasible for, for the use. Uh, what we are doing is a parallel beam. So then the beam is coming and hitting the detector and you, you read out the whole image using some kind of camera or detector, uh, array detector. Um, this is a nice um, kind of beam because you have no geometric unsharpness. Um, it's very simple reconstruction. So you can just use the uh, filter back projection algorithm and um, you are happy. Um, but 
in most cases, you can't have a perfect parallel beam. Well, you can have it, for example, at synchrotrons, you can get a very nice parallel beam. Uh, with neutron imaging, we say we have a parallel beam, but we still have a slight beam divergence. Then the next step was to step uh, with the normal uh, X-ray lab sources is um, to use a fan beam. So then you use the central beam, it's collimated up and down, and then you let a fan go out um, and then you can have a line detector or maybe a few line detector. And it's actually what is used now in the most of the medical CT devices because it's relatively easy to have this um, uh, small array. And then if you go um, on, I would say many lab-based uh, X-ray systems, they use cone beam. So then you actually also look in um, in the vertical direction of the cone. So in this, uh, and also in fan beam, you have a magnification. And the magnification depends on if you have a source and detector, where you place the sample between them, you get different magnification. So um, this is a pretty nice thing if you want to, um, you don't want a high resolution detector, but you want still magnification, uh, you want to have uh, small pixels, then you can just move closer to the source and then you have your magnification. Um, the reconstruction is non-trivial. Um, so um, one way is actually an approximation, which is, is used very much, is defined by Feldkamp. Um, it is doing a pretty good job, but you should, when you use this algorithm, you should try it anyway to have a very shallow uh, cone angle. So if you have the, the wider cone angle you, you have, the more artifacts you can expect. And with the um, cone beam, only the central slice is the one that is exact. The rest has some kind of distortion. And this can be shown here that we have our um, uh, object and we want to scan it. And if you have a stack of, of disks, this is um, this example is actually called a Feldkamp killer because it's it's um, showing that the Feldkamp that the, actually the the backside of the Feldkamp algorithm. You want to see this stack, but if you have a cone angle of thirty degrees, you will get the nice in the middle, um, nice reconstruction. But as soon as you go more and more away from the central slice, you get really ugly. Um, cone beam artifacts. So that is something you have to be aware of when you set up a cone beam system, that um, you should maybe try to uh, get the magnification by putting the source of the detector further away, which gives you a more narrow cone angle, and then you get a better images out of it. So this was not a nice solution. Um, okay, I'll come to that, the other one uh, soon. Um, but um, anyway, you had uh, actually Robin already mentioned this penumbra blurring. And that is uh, in our pinhole optics that we use. We have some aperture and um, then we put the source far away from the detector plane. And we still have a slight divergence, not much, but slight. Um, so we are talking sub degree. But it is still enough to show there is some blurring. And this blurring depends on how far away the object is from the detector. And it's described by this collimation ratio, or L over D, that we usually are talking about. And at many beam lines, uh, neutron imaging beam lines, we are talking about an L over D in the range from um, low low end uh, beam lines, maybe around 50 and high end 1000. So that's the range. For example, the beam line I'm working at, Icon, we have, depending on the aperture, I think it's 150 for the largest aperture, which means a lot of neutrons, but you have also a lot of blurring. Um, our normal working range is about 350. And then we can, by reducing the um, aperture size, even further, we can maybe get up to 600. Yeah, we can even get further, but usually we are not. 
So these are the, the ranges that you can talk about. And um, this is what you can see what happens if you have um, an object. This is a gadolinium sheet, which is extreme absorber. And um, I have here uh, L over D, um, yeah, as a year up to 2000. Uh, what you see here is an image which is taken just three millimeters away from, uh, from the detector. And if I move it um, 30 centimeters away, you can see this is the blurring you get. The same object, but just by moving it away from the detector, you get also much blurrier data. Uh, this is clearly visible um, in particular because this um, detector I used uh, has um, 13 micron uh, pixel size. So if you have, you have to actually balance the L of D against uh, object size and pixel size. And in the end, you can see then uh, what you need to do. Um, here's an example of what can happen if you, oops, no. So um, if you have an object, a relatively large object, and measure at high resolution, then you can see here we have one point A and the B that A, very saturated, um, actually paints out on many more pixels than the B does, which is much closer to the detector. And now if we do a tomography, rotating the object, we have these points that um, that B would be over here. And then instead of just painting out this little area, it would paint out this area. So depending on where you're looking from, you will get different projections from the same point in the object. And um, this we could demonstrate on these images that we had an object which where we have, it's a diesel particulate filter. So it's a very grid, uh, shaped uh, object and um, the central slide and in the central region of the object it's fine when we go out to the periphery at 90 degrees as i mean just straight line through it's well in the middle here it's relatively okay but you can see already when you come out in this area that it's already getting distorted and if we look at 45 degrees, so meaning we're looking at uh, these um, squares like this instead, then you get this kind of reconstruction. So it's getting really ugly. So um, if we instead, uh, also with this um, very small beam divergence, start using cone beam reconstruction, then you have a better um, interpolation in the data and you can actually reconstruct the same data with much better quality. Even this one, which you would be useful for the investigation, all of a sudden can actually show the structures you're looking for. So sometimes, even though we are usually saying we do a parallel beam, it can be beneficial for neutron imaging to actually work with a cone beam reconstruction. Another way to get around with the um, cone beam is to use a helical scan. And the reason for doing that, or what's happening is that you, while you are rotating the sample, you're not only rotating, but you're also translating it vertically. By doing that, you can actually also get an exact solu uh, solution of the object. And you don't have these um, uh, Feldkamp artifacts anymore. This is very good methods for X-rays where you have at least some beam divergence to talk about. With neutron imaging, actually, I don't think anyone has tried it because the pitch is would be so, so small that it's hard to actually motivate it. Um, but with X-rays, it, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And it's actually the technique that is used uh, nowadays in medical scanners as well because you get so much better quality in the reconstructions. Now, another problem when you come talk about um, geometry is that you have samples that are too large for your object, uh, for, for your detector. And um, 
the requirement is that you should have projections from at least 180 degrees and that the sample must always be visible on the detector. Now, if the detector is too small, you have two cases. One is that it's too tall. So this is the rotation axis and it goes outside of, of the detector vertically, no problem. What you do is just to uh, do a scan, translate it, I do a scan of the next piece. Everything is fine. However, if the object is truncated from the sides, you will lose information, relevant information, and then you, we are talking about a truncated reconstruction. And when the reconstruction is truncated, that will introduce, for one, artifacts, um, biases, and um, that is, um, in some cases, you say, okay, I can live with the biases. I want to reconstruct that thing in the middle, but it's not any the reconstructed attenuation coefficients. They are not uh, quantitative anymore because um, the things that are outside, they are in the beam in some places, and then you can will see the contribution from them. One way if, to handle the large sample object is to translate the, um, the object. So if you have um, your reconstruction axis and you would uh, normally, you would just uh, rotate it around uh, the axis like this, but it's too wide. So what you do is you move the axis out to the corner and then you rotate around that axis instead, at uh, that point instead. And then uh, you have to do some stitching and you can reconstruct everything. I have done some such experiments. Uh, it's very popular to do um, with the x-rays and um, it is in principle feasible, but the problem is the experiment time will increase radically. On, and that may not be what you can do. Uh, otherwise, you will introduce a lot of artifacts. The signal to noise ratio is going down, and so on. So, um, but this is an option actually that you can play with. So, um, a little bit um, more about the truncated tomography is, um, yeah, that's already said. And you get these truncation artifacts, like spikes on the edges. And that's an effect in, in uh, some reconstructors that um, they don't filter in a nice way. And then you get really ringing artifacts along the edges. And um, instead, what, for example, I have done in, in my reconstruction tool uh, is to, uh, to do some smart padding of the data. And then we move out all these artifacts to places where they are not seen. What I'm talking about is this brighter um, edge effect here, and also that it gets brighter around here. Um, okay, it's maybe not so much in this case, but it can be worse and really extremely high intensity artifact. And by doing this uh, padding trick, you can see that this streaks um, along the border is less, and then also here in this area is also less. So you can actually get rid of some of the artifacts caused by truncation, but um, it's better to try to fit in the object as much as possible within the, the field of view. Then um, I was talking about the reconstruction axis. So the object is actually rotating around a certain point, as I showed before. And it's very in, uh, important for for the reconstruction that you know exactly where you have this point in the data. So you can have it, um, if you're rotating it around the wrong point, you get artifacts that looks like what you have here on, on these two examples. This should be a round pin, but due to um, this centering uh, misalignment, you see that you get these streaks that uh, goes out. Um, also on this, um, not you can also see um, that there are some streaks going out and actually the rest of it also looks a bit weird <clears throat> so 
you will get a lot of artifacts if you don't center well. If you center it almost good, then it appears more like some kind of unsharpness on the objects. So if you expect the images to get sharper, uh, to be sharper, then you can also tweak uh, the center rotation a little bit. And um, we are talking about sub pixel changes. So it can be half a pixel change can actually make the image sharper. Here are some um, examples what happens. So here I have a center offset of minus eight pixels. And you can see that here you got some really ugly streaks. If it's perfect, then you see nice round shapes. And if you do a center offset of plus eight pixels, then you get the streaks in the other direction. But this only applies if you have done a 180 degree scan. If you do a 360 degree scan, you can't distinguish between plus or minus eight pixels because they both draw unsharp um, halos around the object that looks the same. So then it's actually only to guess. <laughs> Do plus or minus a little bit and you see if it's getting better or worse. That's the only way to do it. Um, the reason why I'm that why you're doing the 360 degree scan in neutron imaging is because of the divergence. Because that's um, the divergence we have caused by the L over D is actually introducing some kind of artifacts that looks like this, um, the centering artifacts. But if you do a 360 degree scan, it averages out. Okay, it's a little bit blurrier, but it actually average out and compensate for each other. So um, we do mostly do uh, 360 degree scans with neutron imaging. And then we are, allow us ourselves to say we have a parallel beam. It's a bit of cheating, but it's actually, it looks pretty okay. So um, we live with this little cheat. So finding the center, there are different ways of doing it. And what we usually do is we have two projections. You have projections one and you have projection two. Projection two, you have got um, at the opposite side or of opposite view. So it's, uh, this one is taken at uh, zero degrees. This one is at 180 degrees. And when you want to find the center rotation, what you do is you mirror that one and then you try with correlation or similar uh, techniques to find the point where they actually overlap. And that, gi that gives you some kind of position offset and that tells you where you have your center rotation. If you have reconstructed data and you see these streaks, there is a quick fix to do it. You can just measure going with a mouse um, pointer or whatever your, is your preference. Uh, measure the distance between this solid part and this streaky part. And that gives you some kind of delta radius divided by two. And then you try it plus minus the current uh, center rotation. And with that, you get pretty close to uh, the real value. So that gives you uh, some indication how you can quick um, correct it uh, manually with the reconstruction. In case the um, center rotation algorithms don't do what they are so bad, um, do what they're supposed to. More things about um, the center rotation is that when we have um, tilted sample or tilted table, that's two different cases. So both cases, the sample is tilted, but the question is where it's tilted. So first of all, we have uh, our tomography uh, axis, we're rotating around it, it's fine. If it's perfectly vertically aligned or aligned with the detector grid, everything is fine. However, if it's tilted, standing tilted on the detector board, what is happening, it is rotating around like this. So it's actually following the, uh, the edge of, of, the object, uh, of the table. And um, yeah, it's not so easy to rotate like this. Um, but anyway, that is also okay because 
Um, the only thing is that you will get elliptic uh, cross sections when you look at these uh, uh, cut planes. But well, that can be aligned in software afterwards. And as soon as, uh, as long as you get sharp reconstructions, that's fine. The problem is when you have the object or actually the, the sample table is tilted and then you rotate around like this, then you're not aligned with the detector um, grid. And the effect is that if you find the center rotation at this green slice, then um, you think, hey, fine, it's good. But if you look at the reconstruction as a piece up, then you see all of a sudden you have the effect as if you were not centered. So it gives you on one side a very nice centering, but it can also give you several less nice centering. And actually um, the effect is that you have like a cone going out of unsharpness from the central slice that you reconstruct the first, you have a cone of unsharpness. And when you're really up on the top or down on the bottom, then this cone is gives you extremely unsharp and ugly images. So what you um, uh, what you did was um, uh, what you have to do is to do some kind of tilt correction. So one way is to actually to rotate all the projections by this angle that your sample table is um, rotated by. So you correct it by that way. The other way, if you have tilts, which are, I would say, less than half a degree, then you can actually correct it in, in the reconstruction also by moving the center of rotation a little bit for each slide. And that works pretty well as well. So um, I have a question here about um, why we do 180 instead, no, 360 instead of 180. And then I go back, uh, let's see. Where do I have it? No, it's okay. I think I just have to take the whiteboard. Um, let's see. Can I do that? No, not so easily. Okay, then I draw it on the side somewhere. Let's see if I can find a place. Yeah, here is a good place. So, why we want to do uh, the center rotation. Um, no, the rotation with the 360 degree instead is that if we have an object like this and the beam is slightly divergent, then you get some unsharpness. So that would be some kind of unsharpness around the object, oops, like this uh, from that side. And that will give you some blurry effect that almost looks like what you see down here. Um, if you take the beam from the other side, well, you rotate, and then you take the contribution from this side as well. And then you also get some blurring oops, like this. Um, that is kind of um, compensating the errors that you get um, from only one-sided imaging. So actually, it's the averaging effect that... Um, um, so this object for one, get a very wide effect. And if you rotate it, it gets a narrow effect. And together, they average out, and that gives you a better reconstruction than if you only did uh, three, 180 degrees. Coming back to the tilted um, acquisition axis, there are also two ways to tilt the axis. One is um, if you go in the, in the beam direction um, and it's tilted in that direction. That is the example that I showed before. No problem, that we can handle. That can be handled by rotating the projections so they are straight up, or it can also be um, done by correcting the center rotation. A trickier one is when the beam is actually, when the beam would go in that direction and it's um, tilted in that direction. That is first 
much more difficult to detect and to correct it you need to uh, you you can do it but then you need um, a reconstructor that includes the whole geometry of um of how the sample is placed and in a parallel beam reconstruction tool it's usually not included you can include it in a cone beam reconstructor but um i haven't seen any out there who actually gives you this possibility oh well wait maybe maybe you can do it in astra somehow but i haven't played with it myself so i i can't really tell how it really works um well someone says it feels dangerous to do data manipulation for small details that we are interested in um uh, microstructures in uh, metals for example well right now it's not really data manipulation uh, that comes later uh, the reconstruction itself is just about setting the geometry in a way that um, you get the sharpest images it's, so it's not really a data manipulation of course if you want to resolve um, very small details you have to go for um methods that um or actually detector systems that are high resolving and then already the objects already get so small that you can get close to the detector and then the penumbra blurring doesn't uh, affect you that much anymore so that is actually uh, when you want to see small details usually you have to have so small samples that you can get close to the detector and then the effect of um of the collimation ratio is less um, severe. So um, it's not much about, so this thing about doing 360 degrees, okay, it's a kind of averaging effect. But anyway, if you are looking at very small details, then it doesn't really, it's not that um, severe anymore. It's more uh, the whole thing about um, um, low L over D, comes more into the effect cases when you have large objects and large distance away from the detector. So the smaller the objects, the less the impact is of, of L over D. So uh, sampling is the next topic. Now we leave the geometry. Um, now let's take another question before I do that. Uh, tilt along the beam. It is also uh, related to the uh, rotation table. It's usually the table that is standing in the wrong way, uh, wrong, um, or else, yeah, no, I would say it's mainly because of the table is standing the wrong way. Um, otherwise, it would be that you have the whole beam line is um, tilted, which usually the construction engineers have made sure that it's actually pretty horizontal. So that is mainly that the stage is maybe slightly tilted in the beam direction. Um, normally, we can actually align the table very good. So really below um, half a degree or even better, just using the, the old plain old water level, we can actually align it pretty good. So normally when we do set up our experiments, we just take the water level and align it. Um, in the uh, beam direction, what I usually do myself is actually also to rotate the camera. I first take the water level on the table. Uh, then I rotate the camera in a way that I have a vertical line that it is as vertical as possible on the detector plane. And this combination together, I am usually on 0 0.2 degrees um, alignment between sample and um, and detector. So it, it can be done pretty well. And th this last fraction of a degree, it is um, acceptable to correct for. I mean, that's, that's what, we, what we have to live for. And then there's another question about finding the center of an irregular object, no problem. You just um, um, 
do the same way. Uh, so what I normally do is some kind of correlation thing that I actually sweep over. Um, I have the projection uh, line of the object, and then I just do correlation and see when I get a nice peak, and that is the top. And it could be, for example, my hand. And you can see here that if you would do the correlation between the fingers here, you see that, okay, in the beginning, there is not so much information. And then at some point, it's perfect overlap. Uh, maybe, so if you had to take only three fingers, or four fingers, it's now, the thumb is also down here. Um, it's less signal than if I would get all five. And that is, that's fine then. So it's, it's no problem to have irregular shaped objects. I mentioned a while ago now um, that we have to have many projections. And the sampling theorem actually tells us how many we need. And typically, uh, what we need is pi over 2 nu. And nu is the number of pixels that the object takes on the detector screen. So for example, if you have the object uh, needs 100 pixels, to, on, the, on the detector, that means you should, in principle, take uh, 150 projections to get uh, a fully sampled uh, image. Now, one uh, factor 1.5 that would, for a 2K detector, mean you need to take 3,000 projections. Sounds like very much. It is also very much. So let's take a look at what happens when you increase the number of projections. So here I have one projection. Of course, it doesn't give any good reconstruction. Two, neither. Four, yeah. By eight, you start seeing actually structures already. But there's a lot of these line artifacts, which is due to the undersampling. And then when you increase, you can see that these um, artifacts, they get more and more dense, um, 32. So um, this image here is actually 256 by 256. So the ideal sampling would be to do 384 projections. And of course, it looks fantastic. But you can actually go down to half the width of the object, and still you don't see much of these artifacts. So um, that is actually what we're doing a lot. We are, we are often in the range of between half or even, or even a quarter of, of the projections that are needed. And that's for, for the noise levels that we have, we don't see these artifacts mostly. So you can actually go down a lot at the cost of some uh, noise possibly, but um, the noise levels that we get in the images in the projections is mostly uh, stronger than this uh, sampling artifact. So why do you get this kind of artifacts? Um, that is looking into the sampling theorem. We have to go back to the Fourier domain. If you remember, uh, with the Fourier, Fourier slice theorem, we took the lines and were drawing them at different directions. And as long as, uh, and the idea is that we need to fill the whole Fourier space with these uh, projection lines. If we don't, we get a sparser um, wheel like this. And you can also see that um, out here, you get all these spots and uh, all, all these spokes here. And um, each one of them is producing lines in the reconstructed image. You can also see that for low frequencies in the middle here, it's better. So you can actually, by reducing or downsampling the images, if you have too few projections, you can actually downsample and then you fulfill the sampling theorem. Of course, at the cost of pixel size and resolution, but anyway, that is um, a trick you can use if you, for some reason, need to scan fast or don't have time to get all the projections you need. The trick you can take is actually to downsample and a twofold gain in it. One is you fulfill the sampling theorem. And second, if you downsample by a factor two, for example, you have increased your signal to noise ratio by a factor two as well. So you get less noise and 
you fulfill the summing theorem. Which brings me over to noise and dose. Um, typically, what we have um, in the images is some noise that comes with us. Actually, additive is not always true. For example, Poisson is more uh, rather multiplicative. But anyway, if you look at the Radon transform of, um, of an image, you can see that the clean image, um, the Radon transform as such is an additive transform. So if you have contributions of two kinds, they are actually added together to the final result. So if you have uh, the ideal um, sinogram adding noise, it's actually the same as doing the inverse transform of the noisy image, and then you get the information like this. Uh, we have different noise sources. We have the thermal noise from the electronics, which is Gaussian, has a Gaussian distribution. We have algorithmic uh, rounding, interpolation noise, uh, sampling noise, which usually has a binomial distribution. And then we have also noise from the radiation source. So it's kind of a counting noise and that's Poisson distributed. And when I'm talking about dose is actually the amount of radiation events that are hitting the detector or actually, yeah, hitting the detector and are detected. And um, the more um, events we get, the better signal to noise ratio we get. So in principle, the longer you measure, the nicer images you get. And um, typically, uh, as we are talking about mainly Poisson noise, let's see if I have that as a slide, no. Um, if we are talking about, uh, we are mainly talking about Poisson noise and the signal to noise ratio is related to the count as a square root. So the signal to noise ratio is equal to the square root of counts. Meaning we have our dose, which is more or less equal to flux versus uh, times the time. And um, to improve the dose, we have different options. One, changing the beam intensity. That's limited possibility. You can sometimes play with an aperture to get more or less. Um, Tweaking the source itself, if you have a reactor or um, accelerator-based um, source, it's set to a maximum level. You usually can't go beyond that. You can actually you can do it less, but that's not in your interest. You can work with the exposure time and um, doing four times the exposure, you will get a doubling in signal to noise ratio, which is good already. Uh, you can also work with the number of projections. So instead of taking 300 projections at this, and you can do 600 projections with the same exposure time, and then you have actually doubled the, do uh, the dose. Um, you can also change the detector. Um, the detector, it's more about the de uh, detector efficiency, what kind of scintillator you're using, how well it captures the neutrons, uh, can also be the camera, which has different uh, quantum efficiencies uh, that also improves um, how much you can get uh, through. And actually, the whole story is not so simple as I tell it right now, because you have different level of uh, different types of noise uh, sources in already in the, in the conversion process. And for one, you have the conversion from neutrons into visible light. But then you also have how much light, visible light is produced. So that's a second um, Poisson process. So you have different um, Poisson processes uh, cascaded after each other. Um, the contrast is something that we want to also work with. Um, how? Do we, how do we get better contrast in the images? So um, we have different um, parameters that we can play with. One is the contrast in the, in the slice that you want to see. Um, this multiplied by the width of the sample is in some degree um, 
proportional to the uh, contrast within the projections times the number of projections. And you can see the effect of it in this sequence. I did a numerical little uh, demonstration where I have a round object with different insets of different contrasts. And um, well, a thousand to one is well kind of visible thanks to probably thanks to the, mainly thanks to the color map that I'm using. Um, but then I have the, the highest uh, is um, uh, two to one, and then you have really a strong um, contrast in the data. And then I I'm working here with noise-free data, and I'm trying to work with six bits up to 13 bits of acquisition. And the result is that if you have six bits, that is 64 gray levels in the projections, you can see that you have a lot of artifacts. You can see uh, this is two, uh, two to one, one to one, one to two, and so on. So I think, so you, you don't see much at this spot. If you double the number of gray levels, then you already see a much better. You can see, guess that this one is here. Maybe if you know it, you could expect something to be around here possibly. And then when you increase the number of gray levels more and more, you can see that you get contrast. So that means in principle that also again, with longer exposure times, you get more gray levels and then you get better reconstructions. So it's not only the noise, but also how many gray levels you have within the data. And artifacts, of course, that's something that we have all the time. And uh, typically artifacts that we have in the neutron images or in tomography in general too, is ring artifacts. You see them in any uh, tomography reconstruction, unless someone has done anything against it. Line artifacts is, something that we see a lot in uh, neutron imaging. We have white spots in the projections and each white spot causes afterwards a line in the reconstructed data. Uh, high contrast artifacts, it's a streaky kind of artifact um, outgoing from, for example, if you have an enclosure of um, much uh, water or something like that, you can get streaks that goes out from the object. As in, in the extreme case, it's actually saturating the detector or starving out the detector, actually. Um, then motion noise, if the requirement for reconstruction is actually that the sample is not moving while you are acquiring. And if it's moving, then you will get motion artifacts. Same as you actually get in a normal picture. If you are moving fast and have a long exposure time, you see actually some kind of... Um, shape that is ghost shape around the moving part. Beam hardening is something that is mm, not in the first order relevant for neutron imaging. It can be used in a chain of corrections, but um, the beam hardening is something you see very much in, in X-ray imaging. Scattering, however, as you know um, already, uh, neutrons are mostly scattered in by most elements, rarely more or rarely uh, purely absorbed. So um, that will introduce artifacts, which I will show soon. So the ring artifacts is something that looks like this. It's concentric rings in the Im reconstructed images. And uh, they're caused by stuck pixels or a bad, badly cleaned uh, open beam image. And they can be cleaned uh, in the sinogram because you see them as parallel uh, lines parallel to the vertical or to the angular axis. And uh, well, they are the concentric rings. So here is an example of how you can um, correct it. In principle, you just um, compute the projection uh, in this direction. So you sum everything, you get the profile, and then you can subtract that and you get some kind of liney thing, which is subtract from the image, and then already you have a first approach to, uh, to doing ring correction. There are much more advanced ones, uh, which we will look at tomorrow during the, um, the training session. But that's um, right now 
a very basic one to show the principle. You can also correct the, um, the ring artifacts in the reconstructed matrix. Then you more or less do um, a rectangular to polar uh, transform, identify where you have the rings, and then you go back again, and then you do some corrections. Um, it's a good uh, method if you want to try and testing different uh, filtering strengths. It's a quick back and forth, but it's you need to do additional coordinate transformations, which you may not want to avoid. Line artifacts is something that you see a lot in the neutron imaging. You see all these white little dots uh, all over in the image. Each one of these will produce a line in the reconstructed image. And the lines, they can look something like this, but it can also be like looking at the haystack. Everything is just um, a lot of cross-hatched uh, lines all over the image. Almost, in some cases, almost looks like it's noisy, but it's line artifact. Uh, what this is, is actually also an extreme case of a spot. It's one gamma photon that goes through the detector or actually painting along the detector plane and introduce this long, long spot. It appeared on a on sing in single projection. So that's a very extreme one, but it's, this is not a line artifact as such but it will produce a lot of line artifacts. So here's another one. Um, here you can see how it can look uh, in a bad case. See all these lines going in different directions. And um, yeah, you can correct it. And here you can see the difference, which is only lines. In principle, what we are doing is to um, compute uh, to a, a medium filtered version of the image. And um, with that, we can ex detect where we have the, these spots in the projection and correct for them. And that works pretty well. So the general principle of detecting and replacing works pretty well. There are different ways of doing the detection. The medium filter is a basic one. Or actually, you can, you can actually apply a medium filter on the projection only. But then with that, you will introduce additional blurring, which you want to avoid. The motion artifacts is something that looks like this. Um, what you see here is an assemble of um, water-filled um, small spheres, which are shrinking with time. And you can see here, um, as long as time goes, the water evaporates. And you can see this streaky effect here. And um, to get rid of it, one way is to just acquire faster. Uh, the other way is to use the golden ratio to, uh, de to define which uh, angles you want to use for your um, acquisition. Normally, the scan is just um, a sequence with small increments, but with a golden ratio. Uh, yeah, that's coming here. Yep. And I can actually show it. No. Oh, okay. Um, so with the golden ratio, what you do is actually you use the golden ratio to determine the next angle. So the first one is at zero degrees. Next one is down here at 111. And then the next one is going up here to 42 degrees. And then I don't remember. I think it's 153. Yeah, whatever. Um, so you get a very jumpy sequence of angles, but by using them, you can suppress this. And the other thing is, by doing an acquisition in this way, you can actually also, after the experiment, decide uh, how long time frames you want to reconstruct. And that's a very useful thing. If you do want to follow a process um, and you don't really know what time resolution you want to do um, at scan time, then you can decide afterwards with the help of the golden ratio. Uh, scan, uh, you can decide afterwards what you want to reconstruct and how many time frames you want to see. And that's a very nice um, um, feature of the of the golden ratio. Cupping is an artifact, and the reason uh, or what it is is actually that the image is bright along the border, and then it's in the middle. It goes 
darker and darker. And um, that is, for x-ray people, they say, if you have this effect, it's beam hardening. In neutron imaging, it's actually more about uh, background scattering that adds uh, biases to, uh, to the data. And that is what we are trying to correct in our work now. Um, so if you have a mon the way to get around the beam hardening is to work with monochromatic beam, but it's usually not feasible with most lab sources because they have too low flux then. Um, and if you use a polychromatic, you get this dark central region. And um, well, you can correct for it numerically. You can also correct for it by adding um, featured blocks. Um, in medical imaging, they use something called bow ties. So it's a shape um, you put in the beam that you actually add. So it's like a kind of a beam filter uh, with, a different, with a shape that is adjusted to the shape of what you want to look at. Then we have for the scattering, the attenuation law generally assumes that the intensity is absorbed. But with neutrons, this is not true. Most neutrons are actually scattered. So the neutrons that are scattered, they continue to live, but they go in a different direction than you would expect them to. So what's happening is that you have out here, you have a lot of sample scattering that goes all over the place. Usually it has a smooth shape like this. Uh, so some kind of Gaussian-like shape. And that adds a bias to the data. So instead of seeing this red line, you see this. And um, that introduces also these cupping artifacts. And you can see here some elements. If you look at uh, hydrogen, you have most of its scattering and a little, little, little of absorption. And then you have all these here. You can barely see the orange line. Some metals have a little bit more absorption and still a lot of scattering. And there are a few pure absorbers, but they are very few. So in principle for any sample, it actually makes sense to do um, a scattering correction when you work with neutrons. So here is an example. Um, if you want to, um, have quantitative data, you really want to work with the attenuation coefficients that you reconstruct, then you need to do um, a scattering correction. Also, if you're working with the image processing, segmentation algorithms don't like that you have gradients like this within the images. Um, so in our group, we have done a couple of uh, approaches. One was done by René Hassanein, um, or was it back in 2005 or so? Um, but that method, we thought, well, it's not, it's not fulfilling all our requirements. So we started in the whole group to work uh, on a new method, which is based on a grid of dots, which produces um, a black body pattern. And um, then we measure the intensity behind them. And uh, with that, we can actually recreate what it looks like with this uh, scattering, uh, the background scattering from sample and from environment. And uh, using these images with this grid, we can get from an image that looks like this into images like, that look like this. And so you see, you can actually remove this uh, scattering um, artifact or this cupping effect caused by the scattering. Uh, we have also done tests coming to the level that we are within five to 10% uh, accurate uh, to gravimetric um, quantification of water content in objects using this uh, black body correction. So it's really helpful. It, and as comparison, you are 50 to 100% wrong if you don't do it. So it's without this black body correction. Ah, the black body grid, um, sorry. Um, we are using it to get reference images. Um, these black dots, they are absorbers. So there shouldn't be any neutrons that come in uh, behind them. But thanks to the, to the scattering, 
there are neutrons anyway coming behind them. So from these reference images, we measure how much scattered uh, neutrons we have in, in the image. So, and this information is then used in a normalization procedure. So instead of doing the normal Bear Lambert's law normalization, you have to uh, do a pretty large uh, normalization scheme that we correct on different places uh, for this uh, scattered neutrons. So it, it is um, only as reference image. Uh, we have one open beam with the BB grid in to get the background scattering uh, from the instrument. And we have one BB with the sample in to get also the contribution by, by the sample itself. When we do tomography, we actually also rotate the sample in a way that um, uh, so we can see actually contributions in different orientations of the sample. Uh, what you see here in, in the, this image is a flat object. And uh, here it actually makes sense to do uh, tomography with black bodies. So in one case, you would have it like this. and the other case, you would have it like this. And that gives very much different uh, scattered fields behind it. Also, uh, in, if you would have a round object, it doesn't really make so much sense to do it full tomography. Then you can just take it from one direction. But typically, when you have objects like also statues that have an arm that hangs out, um, that also produces a very characteristic um, scattered field at different directions. Which brings me to the end. Um, actually, I've talked now for quite some while about tomography, which is an indirect acquisition method to get three-dimensional data. You can do it with different uh, radiation sources. You can actually also do it with light if you have transpar sufficiently transparent materials. Um, I always played with the thought that uh, I should take some of these uh, transparent Lego bricks and do a tomography using that. I haven't done it yet, but it's a fun play example. Uh, for the perfect tomography, you need many projections and you also want well illuminated projections. So you have little noise in them, but still you will get artifacts in the data because there's always something that comes in between like uh, all these uh, spots or um, rings, um, but also the scattering, which is a kind of a physical artifact that comes into the data. And well, that was all I had to tell about uh, tomography.